Welcome to Watermark's Church Leadership Podcast, a conversation with church leaders for church leaders. I'm your host, John McGee. Thanks so much for joining us today. Well, hey, friends, welcome back. Join in the studio again with my friend, Dave Bruscus, pastor, church planner, coach extraordinaire. Dave, welcome back, brother. Hey, friend. Good to be with you today. <laughs> We've got a longer series that I want to tee up here in a second. I thought about, and I think I've got second thoughts about this. I was going to talk about basically the workout regimen that we signed up for this year. <laughs> and I'm thinking what we're going to do is we're going to save that to the end of this little series to see if we're still doing it. But I feel like we're kind of two guys trying to relive our prime yeah. and hadn't killed this yet. But how about we'll, we? How about we, what is the right way to say this? How about we under-promise and over-deliver? And my fear is if we... Tease with that, we're not going to get it done. We're 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 uh, we're kind of sensing the same thing. So <laughs> yeah. intentions are very very good. Execution still to be decided. So yes, we'll uh, we'll see how that plays out if we have anything to talk about in uh, uh, in a few weeks or not. But Dave, we're going to do the series here. Uh, you and I were talking about things we had wished we had learned in seminary. So mm-hmm. you and I both went to seminary, and it was just kind of a good prompt, and we just started you know rattling off a bunch of different things, and we thought, well, that, that'd be actually a really good uh, good series. And so we've got uh, six content pieces that um, we're excited to talk about. Uh, I'll introduce our first topic today, but any thoughts as we kind of jump in here, any ways to kind of frame the discussions that we're hoping yeah, to have? Yeah, I think, John, I think you and I come from the very same place, that we are deeply grateful for our seminary experience. So my hope is that Listeners don't think that in any way we're bashing on seminary. That's right. That's right. Um, I still to this day recommend seminary, especially for those whose ministry is going to be in teaching, mm-hmm. education, preaching. Yep. I think it's incre- critically important. And so I hope people don't hear that we uh, we are in any way are diminishing seminary, but there are limitations to it. And yeah. it'd be fun for you and I to talk about that. That's those. right. You, you, you would have to be there... It, I've thought about this. You'd have to be there for 20 years to learn, you know, everything yes. there was to learn. And then by that time, you're kind of getting tired and, you know, you're on the down downhill slope of your uh, of your ministry. So there is limitations. It does what it's really good at doing, which is generally helping people understand how to think well theologically, how to look at scripture, interpret it correctly, and then communicate it. And that, that really is what seminary is for, Well, which is a big part of, of ministry. But boy, there's so much more. There, and there so that is. really is the heart here is like, how, how do we have some conversations around some of the things that we didn't get uh, in seminary, but those are tools that we use every day here as, as a pastor, as a leader. And I also want to say that, you know, if, if you are not pastor, if you didn't go to seminary, have no plans to go to seminary, I think there's actually going to be lots of really actionable ideas here. This, so if you are a small business owner, uh, it turns out you're kind of you know, function as a pastor to those people that uh, that you work with. So I think there'll be lots of points of implication. The title is going to be, and we'll let it stand, you know, what I didn't learn in seminary. And today we're talking about this art of pastoring, not, not the preaching so much, not standing up on a Sunday morning and just saying, Hey, this is what God's word uh, says. I've, I've felt decently prepared. There were some things I, you know, would have loved to learn or had, you know, some of the rough edges knocked off in seminary, but I felt like I could do that. It was the actual, Okay, I'm sitting with people. I am, you know, someone's grieving, uh, someone's preparing for something, someone's caught in habitual sin. Those types of things I felt a little bit, you know, unprepared for and just kind of learn along the way. And I, and I told you before we hit record, I, I think, uh, we'll start with this. I think the thing that seminary taught me how to do was to speak. But turns out as a leader and as a pastor, a lot of what we need to do is to listen. And I didn't learn that skill. And I'd, I'd love to hear uh, any thoughts you have kind of on that one. I think that's right, John. I, I think that I, I was well prepared to teach, uh, to, to, to preach. Uh, I was well prepared to think about the world from a Christian worldview and think even theologically. What I wasn't prepared to do was how to interact with people relationally and pastorally yeah. in the day-to-day, everyday life type ways. Yeah. So l- let's talk about one that I, I don't remember being you know, trained in any way. Let's talk about this, like listening to someone's confession. Okay. Someone comes to you and they say, Hey, I got something I want to confess or something I want to tell you. What, what did you not learn in seminary? What, what have you learned now really, you know, after being a pastor for, for all these years? I think it's such an important category in my experience. And I know mine is different than everybody else's probably maybe some overlap. The two most common things that I've experienced in pastoral ministry is one, someone coming to you, confessing something, just wanting to be assured that they're forgiven. Hmm. And the other thing is the question, what's God's will for my life practically? Yeah. Do I marry this person? Do I take this job? And so so it's a big deal knowing how to respond in the, in the time of confession. I oftentimes address the issue without really understanding it. In other words, I didn't listen closely enough. Yeah. 
and I had a script pop up in my mind very quickly of here's the verses I need to bring to the table. Here's the specific things I needed to say, almost a generic assurance of pardon with my go-to verse rather than listening and even asking follow-up questions about the confession and, and what that does, although that certainly points a person to who Jesus is in that moment. And that's the most important thing we ever do. Sometimes we can leave things on their chest by not giving enough time and space to talk it out. And so p- part of part of taking a confession is being quiet, yeah. listening, asking a follow-up question like, hey, what more do you want to tell me? Yeah. What, what more is there to this? And so uh, it took me a long time to learn that. How about you? Was that your experience I, as totally, well? Yeah, it's really, it's really good. Just the uh, what I resonate with is the jumping in real quick. Yeah. You know, it's like yeah. oh, I've got a good verse. I've got a, I've seen this before. I've got three three points that I want to I want to give you, and, and what I've been telling others in the last several years, I can't remember what we've talked about this on the podcast, but you remember it's a circus. Like you would see this clown just pulling these scarves, you <laughs> yeah. know, either, either out of his mouth or his yeah. pocket or something. I don't even know what. And and a confession oftentimes is like that. Sure. Each each thing is a bit of a precursor to something else that's coming. It's just something else that's coming. And oftentimes, because maybe you've seen it before, you have an answer, and clearly all you want to do is help, you jump in real quick and say, let's talk about that thing there. Well, what happened was you really did short circuit this process where they only were going to confess in these little, these little bits. And really, I think they're trying to see how you're going to respond. Uh, to that. Yeah. And so if you're shocked, if you put shame or guilt on them, or you just admonish them right away, and, there, and there's, there is a time to admonish for sure. But if that's where you lead with, then you, you know, it's, it's kind of a silly metaphor, but I think about this actually when, when people were talking that I'm about to short circuit, you know, those, those, you know, scarves coming out and I'm only going to get the part that they just released. Cause if I jump in right now, I won't get the rest of the story. And so, and I think it's good, Dave, just being being quiet and um, just being there in that in that moment—it's a pretty holy thing to sit in someone's con- confession, where they're you know they've done something they're ashamed of, want to know how to make sense of it theologically, what what next steps to take. And I, I would just say now I know to say less, uh, not more, or and definitely to wait till I speak until uh, until I've listened. And I think even just like what you say, I'd be curious. I, I want to ask. I want to ask you, what do you say? As soon as, let's say I confess to you, what, what would be the first thing that you would say? But I, I would say whatever it is that you say, whatever it is uh, that you do, however you act, and we've said this before, that when someone confesses, what happens in the next 10 seconds to that person could be the most important 10 seconds of their lives. Like these, these moments are really, really pregnant. So do you have a, do you have a, this is what I say when someone confesses. Do you have, is there something yeah, in your first response? Yeah, you know, I, I do. I probably have somewhat of a formula, John. And then I, I, I remember vividly back to one time receiving a confession with a pastor that was more seasoned than I was. So I did in that instance have the advantage of a mentor. And when we were through with that first experience, and I botched it in many ways, one of the things he did, he pulled me aside and he said, you're too quick to try to alleviate the sorrow this person is feeling yeah. like there's a godly sorrow Leads to, to this. Repentance. Let them sit there a little bit in it. I, I, I think probably cause I'm maybe even in a gifted way, want to be merciful that I can sometimes just want to, Hey, I want to, I want to soothe your pain right now. And there's a good pain that we sit in when we confess, but usually I'll immediately say, thank you for trusting me with this. Uh, I'll, I'll affirm the confession as it is like, Hey, yeah. this is a good thing. And thank you for doing it. Yeah. But then I'll, I'll, I'll pause and, and, ask the question, is there, is there more you want to share? Is there anything you feel like you haven't shared yet? Like keep going or uh, even ask question, how, how are you feeling about this? And what, what more, what more would you like to say? So yeah. take as much as they're willing to give. And I think there's, I, I don't know if this was your experience. Oftentimes there's, they're looking for visual clues. Yeah, that's they're looking at body language. 100%. They're looking, are you going to, are you going to be disgusted with what I'm telling you? Are you going to be disappointed? Are you going to shut the door in my face? And so I, I think even just trying to be as where as I can be without having a mirror in front of me, yeah. my body language and trying to look peaceful and calm and not shocked, yes. but uh, even lean in physically a little bit more, like physically move a little bit closer to them and look them in the eye and say, what more? You know, is there, is there more you want to say? That's good. Those are some really, really great practical uh, handholds. And we were with some younger leaders earlier today and uh, we were talking about this, this, this topic specifically, you know, about sitting with someone who's confessing and how oftentimes when they, you know, tell you something, you're, 
<laughs> your first step is, or your first thought is, you did what? You know, or <laughs> I can't believe that. And um, which is fine to think, you just can't let it hit your face. You can't, so we're, we're you can't let, you pull like, that jaw off the floor yeah, quickly. Yeah, it's it, not it, helpful. A, a strategy that I, I use, I still use it, but definitely when I was, uh, it was younger, was just to take some of that tension and just kind of curl up the toes of my feet. Like I, I had something, this, I like has got, this has got to come out somewhere. I can't let it come out <laughs> on my face. And, uh, and so that would, you know, you could clench your, uh, your hands under the fish foot, but just, yeah, you can't let it out on the face. So it's so, so good brother. And, uh, and again, um, I think all of this, probably the answer to any of this is, uh, practice. Mm-hmm. It's paying attention. Yeah. Uh, it's asking those who have been there before ride alongs, if you can, in any capacity, that's good. Uh, just watching other people, watching other skilled, um, you know, leaders, pastors, shepherd, different situations. Um, you know, we can learn a lot from books, but there's just something about either our own mistakes or watching someone else who's really gifted. And that'll, that'll be the answer to uh, a lot of those. So uh, one of the things I, I was thinking about just the art of pastoring is the, the whole idea of, um, you know, marrying, burying yes. and hospital visits. Yeah. So I, boy, I've made so many mistakes here, but let, let's start, uh, we'll go in reverse order, but hospital visits, yes. any, any wisdom for those who uh, have been to seminary, haven't been to seminary, mistakes made uh, around just visiting people uh, at a time of need? Yeah, I do remember, in all fairness to my seminary experience, I remember a brief section of a class on hospital visits. I think I, think I had do you remember the, that. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. So, and I, and I did get some real helpful pointers, but I think there are so many protocol issues in making a hospital visit. And if anything, John, those things have only been increased That's right. That's right. In, in this day of post-pandemic health and HIPAA laws. And so I think first and foremost, you really need to think about what are the expectations of the hospital staff? I, I know that may be not the most important thing you need to consider, but I think if you really want to be a good steward and you want to represent the Lord well, stepping into a space and not upsetting the equilibrium of a space, especially if you go in and you serve well the patient, but you disrupt the medical attention that person gets, or you cause some that's sort good. of, that's good. Um, you know, you, you cause some sort of issue to be among the staff. That's not a good thing. So, you know, know what you're stepping into, know what the expectations are. So usually I will, I'll even text the person if it's appropriate or the closest family members to let them know, Hey, I'm coming by. That's is good. that, is it okay? I'd love that's to good. come visit. Really and pray with. So number one, I really would like to have permission or a go ahead. Then the second thing I'll do is once I arrive at the hospital, I will check in at multiple places going in. I will check in on the floor. I'll check in with a charge nurse. I'll, I'll, I'll knock on the door and make sure it's okay that I come in. I'll announce my uh, walking into the room before I step into the room. I will certainly look to the patient, but I'll also greet and introduce myself to everybody in the room, especially if there's medical help there. I want them to know who I am. That I noticed at times I think there's fear. I don't know if it's the way I look or the way I dress, but there's times I think there's fear that I might be an attorney, you know, and everybody's afraid of malpractice. And that's the last thing anybody wants to see. That's the last person anybody wants to see Truly. walking into a room. And then I want to be attentive to the person's physical condition. Yeah. And I want to be appropriate with my work. If they're in a lot of pain, I don't want to be lengthy. Yeah. If they are in and out of consciousness, I'm going to try my best to certainly pray, but but care for the people that are family members. And I think that's the other thing you want to do is, is you're serving the patient, but particularly if it's a critical care type situation, yeah. you you want to care for everybody in the room. Yeah. You know, you want to include everybody in the room. You, you don't want it to be a... Uh, a private moment between you and the patient, which everybody else is looking on. You really want to. You really want to pass through the room, if you will. Uh, you certainly want to abide by every sort of hygiene standard there is. Wash your hands before you go in. Wash your hands when you leave. Ask if there's any special needs you need to be aware of. And so, uh, and then, and then I don't know what you think. When I, I almost felt like initially when I started making hospital visits, what I was doing was bringing Sunday to the patient. Here's, you know, so if I could good. sing, I would have sang the song. So good. I would have yeah. preached a sermon, probably would have passed an offering play. That'd be inappropriate. <laughs> but, you know, whatever it is. But you know what? You're, you're really there yeah, that's right. just to assure them as simply as you can of the presence of God with them and the way that God cares for his people. Yeah. And if the church is a family, right, a family of God, it's just what family does. And we just show up and, um, you know, yeah, I think I think my learnings would be I, I thought I had to... Uh, that's, that's just such a succinct way to say it brings Sunday to them. And I, I've got this memory and, um, I was a youth pastor visiting a kid in the youth ministry. And, um, and so the, the room was kind of crowded. So I'm sitting on the, the 
stand, I'm standing on the foot uh, of their bed, and I've uh, and I was just like, oh, I've just thought about this verse, and I wanted to uh, read it to you. And like the nurse walked in, so what it looked like was literally like I'm sitting at the foot of this, you know, teenager's bed, <laughs> like yeah. preaching a sermon there to her, you, you know. And I just thought, you know, I don't. That's not what I'm doing, but that's not definitely what I want to do, you know. And I, people. Uh, they, they might say, Hey, do you have any verses that, you know, come to mind or that I, I was wondering about this totally appropriate, but you don't need to go in there and, and blow no. their minds with some, uh, wild, you know, novel spiritual insight. They just want to know that you, you care for the most, most of the time, uh, that you're there. Uh, sometimes, you know, they just might need some physical help and just, yeah. you know, I ask the family, Hey, is there anything, you know, you don't have that I could get you? Is there anything you need that you don't, uh, that you don't have just, and don't, yeah, you don't want them to feel like they've got to entertain you, that they've got to somehow be grateful uh, for your presence. You're just there to serve them. And when you get this sense like, yeah, that's probably done. I'm, I'm good. Then, um, you know, then you can, uh, you can walk out. A lot of times people need respites. That's right. Uh, and so you could say, Hey, I just, I'm glad if they're sleeping, I'm glad to sit here. I've got a book I want to read or some things like that. And if you guys want to go, go grab dinner and just, you know, uh, or go lay, go lay down if you want. I'm told like you didn't say anything. You're just kind of serving. So, uh, yeah, those are, those are all the things that, um, I like that I've learned. And I think just moving in slowly, softly, quietly, that's what people remember. I, you know, I just can't ever remember someone saying, I remember you, you visited me in the hospital and you said X. I never remember that. What I remember is, Hey, I was in, I was in the hospital and you came and, and you saw me and that, that meant a lot to me. Yeah. And it was just, it was present. So I, I like then, your, I like your emphasis on brevity too. I think that's important, John. You know, I, I've been, I've been as a family member in the hospital when a, family members, pastor would visit or, or minister from the church would visit. And there's a sense in which that's an intimate moment for the family. And, and, you know, there's boundaries there. And so I, I, again, I'm a big believer of less is more, obviously, if a person's alone and they want you to stay and they ask you to stay, you do. Yeah. And then I think another thing real simply is take a gift with you, huh. especially if you know the person, uh, you know, so back in the day, if it's a young man and I know his, uh, you know, his favorite team is the Green Bay Packers, I'm bringing the Green Bay Packer preview magazine to him and oh, like, hey, I, I know you're going to be laid out for a while. Oh, Here's awesome. something. So what, you know, something that shows not only do I care for you, but I know you yeah. and knowing you, here's just a simple gift that's inexpensive, but it's personalized and tailored for you. I love that. Well, I, last one on this one. Uh, I learned this from my dad. When you go to see uh, someone with a newborn, right? everyone is going to be doting over the newborn and, and you know what about the poor mom that just you know gave <laughs> birth to one. this human right right and so my dad uh and i remember when we had our first child he walked in he, this is his first grand his first grandkid he was so excited uh he he walked uh, right right past his uh his grandson right past me and walked right up to my wife you know I gave her a that. kiss on the on the head I said how are you doing you know you look great how are you and i uh, talked to her you know his grandkid that he's been waiting a long time for he is right there, and then uh, afterwards he went over. And so I think it's just, and, and people want you to be excited about their kid, but uh, there's just there's just some things you'll pick up along the way. So That's not good. to take a morbid turn, but just anything on on funerals. We don't have to go yeah, uh, long man. here. One one of the things I would just tell young pastors is uh, lean on a funeral director. You know, you yes. can walk in, just say, "Hi, this, I'm kind of new at this. Uh, what do I need to know? Where do I need to stand?" Can you walk me through uh, any of this? I would be uh, one thing. Uh, again, brevity, I think, is your friend. Most people are not looking for some really, really long, you know, explanation of the the story of God from cover to cover. And I've, I've actually been to, to funerals where the unplanned nature of the way people shared so many things about that person, they shared the gospel, they were clear on a lot of other things. There just wasn't that much left to say. And, a, and I watched a wise pastor just kind of, synthesize what was said there and like this isn't fundamentally about, about about me about having a platform and just compress that and then i think knowing what kind of funeral this is you know there's there's different kinds yes and, um, there's you know grandma was 99 years old yeah and she lived an amazing life and she we knew uh, this last year she'd been a bit incoherent we're going to celebrate her uh, there's the tragic loss of yeah unexpected of a, of a new person. Those, those are two different, different funerals, a funeral of a, uh, of a, of a new child, you know, mm -hmm. and then knowing who's mm -hmm. in the audience. And, um, I, I tell this to pastors, um, when you do a funeral, like for a parent, when the kids are young, you know, you not to be gimmicky, but you know, I've done this before, pull the kids down front and just go, this, most of this is going to be over your head. But, you know, just like I, I never went to a church like this as a kid, but where a pastor would pull the kids down front, you know, and say, yeah, have sure. kid church for a few minutes, you know, uh, and just say, let's just 
you know, what are some of the questions that you have? Or I bet you these are some of the questions you'd have. One, did did it hurt? You know, mm. it's like I don't know. You know, Bible talks about death being like a sting. So have you ever been bit by a bit by a, a bee and it it stung, but then that was then it didn't hurt. It's probably like that. You know, mm, that's good. And where where are they now? And and then you know, why did this happen? That that's a question I would be asking. And you know, and here's the answer: we we don't know. And uh, I remember one time we did that, and there was like a, um, you know, like a, a Persian rug uh, right there. And I can't remember if I op- pulled it up or not, but just talked about how from the bottom, and I can't remember, that's probably Spurgeon's, I think this is Spurgeon's illustration. You know, from the bottom, a Persian rug looks like a big knotted mess. Yeah, sure. Uh, from the top, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. You know, and just, hey guys. That's a good answer. I know, this doesn't, it just doesn't make sense. This is pretty knotted. It's pretty ugly. I, I know. But can I tell you what? Um, your mom is on the other side. She's with Jesus and she's looking down. And someday we will. And, and it'll make sense, and, but it's okay if it doesn't. It, it it may not, but we can still trust the heart of God, so, you know. So just just shepherding the kids yeah. there, and honestly, <clears throat> those are probably the time you do that with little kids. The adults will that'll be the part that they lean in uh, the most, you know. And and so you just, but you're gonna have to do that. And you're gonna have to be nervous. You're gonna have to uh, fumble your words. But there's the art. There's the art of being with people uh, in in grief, different situations. That is part of the part of the joy, candidly, of being a pastor, being a leader. But uh, it's going to take take some, you know, some uh, just learning and some reps. So, any other thoughts, just on, on yeah, funerals? Yeah, that's good. Well, a couple things come to mind that are probably pre-funeral type things, John. One is, and and I didn't know this. No one taught me this before I showed up in ministry. But I did have on the staff that I first was a part of a man who was a seasoned expert in pastoral care. Love it. So one thing you can do, especially if we're talking about the segue between the hospital visit and or the passing and the funeral, if you will serve the family and be the point of contact to whatever the next step is, that's so helpful to the family. Like, you know, say to the widow, do you have arrangements planned? Yes, I do. May I go ahead and call them on your behalf? You just take so much pressure off that person who just lost a loved one. And the last thing they want to do is start tending to logistics. Some people do, but most people don't. And so I'll pick up the phone, call the funeral home, call the mortician, and just let them know the death has happened, and they will send somebody out to begin to take care of the body. So that's one thing you can do. Then I have found that the most powerful place of ministry to the family is in preparing for the funeral. When you gather the family together in their home or wherever it may be, you start talking about what they want for the service. You ask them about their their memories of the loved one they lost. You ask them about things that matter to that person. You can, in their, in their reminiscing, you can care for them in such profound yeah. ways. And my experience has been, for whatever reason, especially as the family that's in your church, and they're going to be with you for years to come. When they think back on the experience, there's something about that. Hey, when we all got together in my living room and we talked about dad, mm-hmm. I can remember that profoundly. I don't remember much about. Mm-hmm. I don't remember much about the funeral. So, there are opportunities before, during, and after. So, you know, do well during the funeral, but no, the lion's share of pastoral work you do is going to be before and then long after, as you care and love these families. So take the pressure off a little bit. It's going to be a long run with them and caring for them yeah. well. That's really good. That's really good, Dave. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, helping people think through at, at that moment uh, of death or right after, what's the next step? Who do we need to call? Um, that's that's a really great way to, to serve people as you're, as you're grieving. And yeah, facilitating that time of celebration there with the family can be really, really sweet. So good. Okay. On a, on a lighter note, what did you not learn about performing weddings in seminary so, wish you knew now yeah, that, so, wish, that you know that you know now that you didn't know yeah. uh, then wish you did and here's the irony of this conversation uh true confessions you can take my confession now you can practice on me <laughs> i get more stressed out about weddings than i ever do funerals really here's why it seems to me in my experience you show up and you do a funeral and everybody's appreciative for everything you do you show up at a wedding and there's so many things that can you're, go you're wrong performing. There's, yeah. there's such expectations yeah it's a cer- it's a performance ceremony so you know, I think that if there's one thing I would encourage every person to do that officiates a ceremony, have on your team or make sure the bride and groom have a planner, have someone who's actually there to direct yes. the rehearsal, yes. direct the service. It is so difficult to be a pastoral presence in the in the in the, in the rehearsal and the wedding itself when you're running the show, and it's really hard to be barking out orders. 
and then telling the couple how much God loves them at the same time. There's just, and then, or, or keeping the, the in-laws at bay and it's or making sure the groomsmen don't, don't cut up too much or the bridesmaids don't have too many opinions. So yeah. if you can really stay put in the role of officiant and pastor and pastor and not be wedding director, not be event planner, you're in so much better a place. I love it. Yes. So yeah, the, the that is, boy, that is some pro level stuff right there. Um, when you roll in, Find the wedding planner. Tell her she's in charge, and it's your job to help you. Generally, what you're gonna have to do is wrangle the guys. You know, so these guys knew each other from college, and they're gonna cut up. And uh, you could be there all night at the rehearsal, and you say, "I will, I will make sure the guys are there and they're quiet." If you could move us through and just tell us where where to go, you know. And so, that's yes. If that happens, if you have a wedding planner, uh, your life will go well. And I would say, uh, let them run the show and crack the whip, and uh, and you're just there to you know make sure that that everybody likes each other uh, at the end of it. You know, I, I, one thing I would just say is you will make mistakes. I, I just don't know anybody that's done a bunch of weddings that hasn't made a mistake. You will. At uh, one time, I I had the groom, the bride's, the bride's family last name. It was just off, just by a hair. I said it the whole the whole ceremony. <laughs> you know. Still married, but I said I did that. Uh, I've not done this. I feel like everyone has forgotten to s- yes. seat the audience, and yep. they just get in there. They receive the bride and groom and just start talking, you know. And so what happens is, grandma's first about you know fifteen minutes in. She sits down, and then it trickled. By the time you figure it out, you know, then you then they've all sat down on their own, but yeah. they didn't know that some of them had been in church in forever. So I feel like everybody's going to make make that one, you know. But at the end of the day, everybody. Uh, you know what? Everybody's going to be married. And That's so right. you're, you really are a two bit player in the deal. So don't take yourself too seriously. Uh, but be, come ready and, you know, get an outline that you're excited about that you could uh, be excited about with them. You know, one thing I've started doing uh, recently is it, it feels like weddings go really, really quick. Uh, really well, quick. Some, yeah, some do. <laughs> some weddings go quick, maybe better said. And and the couple, before they even know it, you know, they're down in the reception and, you know, they didn't even get to enjoy it. So uh, I've been turning couples after their, you know, husband and wife kiss. And I just tell them and tell the, tell the audience, we're going to slow this thing down. Normally what happens like is uh, I pronounce them and they go running out this door. We're going to, this thing is about to go, you know, at uh, one tenth speed. We're going to turn them around because they, uh, they haven't seen you this whole, this whole time. And I want them to, I want them to know how many people in this room love them, care about them and are going to be cheering them on. And uh, I just want to, I want to give them a minute just to, to look at all of you and, uh, and you know, Hey, if you guys you know, to the couple, if you ever feel like God forgot you, you, uh, he wasn't thinking of you. He just showed you right here. There's, you know, however many people in the room, uh, he loves you through these people here and, uh, you know, let that just kind of oh, settle. Brilliant. And brilliant. then, Hey, now announcing, you know, Mr. And Mrs. John Smith and everybody goes crazy and then they go, and then it goes warp speed again. And so you'll just kind of learn, you know, some people I'm, I'm fine. At weddings. I, I've seen some people are like, well, you are really, really good at this. And they've just done it a bunch. They've, they've paid attention, you know, and uh, it's a, it's a really, it's a, it's an honor and it's a special, special thing you get to do. But, but don't, uh, I don't expect yourself to do the wedding of the century the very first time, like all of these, you're going to have to, you're going to have to make some mistakes, lean in, uh, learn and see it as a, as a real privilege and take, uh, take the role uh, seriously. So Dave, one of the things I think you know, I, I don't remember a class on this. We've talked about uh, listening. Uh, we talked about confessions, which I, I wanted to say this. Uh, we talk about confessions. We are not Catholic priest. And so right. we are not, we are not like absolving right. people. We are not. Uh, that's not when we say confessions. If, if you don't have a category for that, what we're talking about is uh, someone is honest and vulnerable and they're saying, I, I messed up or I sinned. Uh, how should I think about this? And you're there in that moment with them, really telling them about the grace, mercy, and forgiveness of That's God. Right, John. You know? <laughs> That's right. Right, right. First John one nine comes to mind. Yeah. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, forgive us our sin and cleanse us from unrighteousness. Yeah. Really what you're doing is you're attesting to God's character in that moment. That's, that's but a, you're not the one who that's, gives and takes away. <laughs> if that wasn't if that wasn't clear. Yeah. yeah we, sorry about uh, that. I, yeah, we do. Yeah. Um, there. So, okay, so that's the forgiveness piece. What about, you know, uh, admonishment, oh, confrontation, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah. Um, because the role of a pastor is not just to run around and put their arm around people and tell them it's all going to be okay. Uh, sometimes there's sin in an individual's life. Um, sometimes it affects uh, not just them but their family. Sometimes it affects the church, and it's your job. It's a response. You know, it's your responsibility if you're you know a shepherd uh, to protect the flock, or if you're a business owner and you've got a team of twenty, like and something's going awry, like you have to lean in. So what'd you not learn? What'd you wish you had yeah. in seminary about that? You know, something I should have known 
if we were to think through this category in two, two, two dimensions. One is context, and maybe the other, John, would be content. The context of it, and you see this in the Bible, you see this in 1 Timothy 5, we treat different people differently according to their age and status, right? So, so Paul warns Timothy, treat an older man like your father, you know, an older woman like your mother, a younger brother like your younger brother, and a woman like your sister in purity. So we get this sense that not all, not, there's not one size that fits all in the way you talk, in the tone you use, in the approach you take to a situation. The other thing is, I think what I wish I would have known is there is, there's a slightly different approach when someone is acting foolishly, meaning they're not necessarily violating any specific biblical command. There's not a word that you could pick that's a Bible word that that they're guilty of in the realm of sin, but they're just not being wise. They're, they're acting foolishly. There's a way in which you address someone in that category than you do when someone is just blatantly in sin. And so I think it really helps to be well prepared. Yeah. I know sometimes these things happen in the moment and you just you just you just move forward and you trust the Lord because it, it sometimes it requires an immediate response. But when it doesn't, be as thoughtful as you can. And then what I found to be super helpful is memorize two or three talking points, have them in your head, and then uh, audible as you need to as you walk it through. But you're not going to make any impact if the person can't hear you or doesn't hear you, if they don't understand what you're saying. Hmm. And my experience has been oftentimes when you correct or you rebuke someone, their first their first wave of response is emotional, and you have to get past that to really get to a point of clear communication so they understand exactly what you're saying. And then I think you always, always have to be clear that you are there not just to point out the flaw point out the sin, you're also there to pastor them on the other side of this conversation. Yeah, yeah be patient with all men. Um, it was really good, Dave. I, I think mistakes I've made are, one, being uh, too passive and just not mm-hmm. really leaning in. It's like, well, this is sin. It's costing you, know, you, your family, your friends, your church. Like, this is not okay, and I'm going to look you in the eye and tell you that. Now, so being kind of too passive on that or being angry because of like just the frustration that this person has caused to so many people. Right. And so now subtly it, it, it can become not solely, but it can become just a little bit about you. Like, okay, I'm put out with you. Right. Instead of, nope, you know, I want to have the heart of Jesus for this. This person is like, it's, it's more grieving than anything else, but there's a, there's a truthfulness that needs to happen in this moment. And I'm just going to, I'm going to, I love you enough to tell you, uh, but the, but uh, in all things, like, Above all, this is out of love. And so I think those are mistakes that I've made. And so I think when you talk about being clear, I think asking people to repeat back, you know, tell, can you tell me what you heard? Can you tell me, could you, you know, summarize that um, would would be helpful. Uh, so they they might hear, you hate me, and um, right. which, you know, which you probably didn't say. So no, nope, that's actually not what I said. So let me try again. And you tell them, and like, oh, okay. I think there's a wisdom of knowing how much someone can handle in a moment. There's, you know, people get flooded emotionally. I thought, Uh, early on, you know, hey, there's about 15 things in play here. Let's just go ticking through each one of those. And and most people just kind of don't have the capacity to to hold that many disparate ideas uh, together. And so there's a wisdom and the art form of pastoring of knowing basically how much someone can handle uh, in that moment. It's probably and it's probably less than you as the one who's kind of facilitating. That's right. You've had time to think about it. You're coming from it. Don't be vague. You know, uh, vague accusations are really not helpful. Yeah. Have specific examples. Whenever you can, use Bible words for this. This is this is this is deceptive. This is whatever it is. Yeah. But don't you know? And then I don't know how to say this. Help me. Give me language for this because what I've learned, even in young leaders, even when I was inexperienced, we have kind of these spidey senses. Sometimes we have a sense of intuition, and I would say. Uh, maybe this goes back to the thought of being passive. Don't dismiss those. Almost trust those. Verify them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But if if you feel something, maybe it's time to think about saying something. Make sure it's make sure you can validate and verify what it is. But sometimes the Lord gives us those senses so that right. we can really care for people so they don't go into the ditch. Yeah. And I do think I think when I look back, my errors, my sin as a pastor were probably more of omission than commission. Mm. I just should have said something and I didn't yeah. for whatever reason, yeah. but I didn't and I wish I would have. That's good. Hey, can I ask you a question or I'm not even sure if I'm right, but I wanted to 
let me say this out loud and let's just let's just talk about this or you know any of those kinds of things and so that you don't have to paint them into a corner and That's say right. I I've got I just got a hunch this is in play I just want to ask you, but I don't. I don't need to come out swinging and say definitively. That's that's really, really, really good. Well, that will be. You will make some mistakes on that. It's it's just part of it, and you need to lean in, keep learning, keep asking others, watch other people, uh, and know that you know Jesus is with you. I just pray a lot of times, like God, I, I, I lack wisdom. I'm asking you, would you give it to me generously, please? You know, I want I want to serve uh, this brother or this sister really, really well here, and would you help, would you help me do that? Well, you know? I think so. I think John, when when you do make mistakes in that realm. Rather than being uh, overcome with uh, discouragement, understand that you now have the opportunity to go back to that person and huh. own some things, yeah. and you actually can model for them. It's good, not in a manipulative way, not in a, not in any sort of insincere way, but you can actually show them what it looks like to say, you know what, I, I came on kind of strong. I think I said some things that I wasn't certain about, but I said them with such certainty, and I'm sure that must have good. hit you hard. How do you feel about that? Ah, would you forgive me? Yeah. That was not helpful to you, and I just want to be helpful to you. I want to love and serve you well, and I'm afraid I didn't. Would you? Can we try this again? Yep. And uh, there's just a way in which you lead. You lead by example, and I think that's a good way to do it. Yeah, it's good. And you got to be okay with people not liking what <laughs> yeah, you pointed that's out. Right. You know, like, well, you're not my friend now. I mean, yeah. I, there's people that. Yeah, I mean, as you you want to be honest here. There's people that will not talk to me mm-hmm. uh, now because. You know, the sin that I pointed out, tried it. Maybe I didn't do it great. I, you know, on some of these instances, like I think we could replay the tape and I at least got a passing grade. Um, yeah. But they didn't. They didn't want to hear it. And so that's just that's just part of it. And uh, you're responsible. If you know, it's a little bit different if you're running a small business. But if you're a pastor, uh, it is your responsibility mm-hmm. uh, as a shepherd uh, to point these things out. You know, over yeah, time and just good. walk with people. And people people take a lot longer. I take a lot longer uh, to change than I wish was the case. And so just being. Just being there, being patient with all men, knowing that uh, you can point someone's sin out, and it probably doesn't mean that tomorrow they will wake up and it will never be an issue ever again. Uh, you're just going to have to walk with them. Just as others have been really, really patient with you, just as God has been patient with you, um, we want to give that same patience and grace uh, over a long period of time and, and not be frustrated uh, when people act like um, they're still being sanctified. You know, it's like yeah. we shouldn't be surprised. Well, I think, um, I think one ditch we can fall into, I, I've seen this happen a lot, a person, when they don't necessarily agree with your perspective or it feels to them like an attack, what they will do is they'll change categories. They'll take what is a confrontation over sin and make it about a personal conflict. Yes. And that's where you got to yes. stay out of that ditch. you got to be yes. clear, like, listen, this isn't about me and you. This isn't about you and I having some sort of personality conflict. This is something else. And you want to bring it back as much as you can. You can't make a person feel that way. But you can be very clear in your communication. This isn't me against you in any way whatsoever. Actually, I'm for you. And that's why I brought I've, I've brought this to you, and I'm actually here to work this through with you. Yeah, that's good. I thought we'd we'd give a lot more missteps. I'd planned I'd planned to. So let me tee up this one so that I can tell you one of my, uh, just a funny story. Uh, one of the things I didn't realize I wasn't I don't think I was taught or wasn't paying attention to in seminary was the difference between things that are physical issues and things that are spiritual issues. Right. So because yeah. I lived lived in that world, everything to me was a spiritual issue. So you yep. just didn't, you didn't know this verse and weren't obeying this verse. And once you did, then everything would be okay in your life, right? That, uh, that's an overstatement, but there's there's some sense that that was true. And I remember a uh, meeting with so, <laughs> this couple, this is so funny. And it's probably January in Dallas, the wind's blowing. It is so cold outside. Well, we're in this restaurant, we're having breakfast and we're right by the door and there's no, you know, no buffer. There's, when the door opened, in came the wind. And it was so cold. I was actually wearing my jacket. I remember uh, I had this, uh, you know, I was wearing long sleeves and I had this jacket and I've got my hands around a, a warm cup of coffee. And we're talking to this couple who I think they wanted to serve and, you know, in the church and I'm um, just kind of, you know, answer any questions, make sure it's a good fit. You know, both of us are just kind of, you know, trying to size up the opportunity and, and, and each other. And the woman is just kind of, kind of angry. Uh, I'll, I'll, that might be a, a, a good, uh, broad brushstroke. She's just kind of agitated and angry, like the whole, the whole time. And she's also complaining and she's complaining about how hot it is. Right. So here I am <laughs> I in a jacket with my, my hands around a warm cup of coffee. And, and I'm just like, oh, I, I can tell you right now, this is not going to be a fit. And because she is just like this really cantankerous woman, like no one's going to want to be with her. I don't, I mean, clearly she's got no fruit of the spirit. There's no joy, you know, in her, she's just, just complaining. And, and so I just watch this and I'm probably about to, I may even be re- willing to say, I don't think this is going to be a good fit. And then she stops, and, you know, somewhere and she goes, I'm so sorry. I, you know, 
this just happened. I'm, I'm in menopause and I'm I'm having hot flashes <laughs> right now. And this, I am miserable. Oh, she go. goes, I'm so, I probably you know this probably wasn't really fun. Uh, I'm really sorry. And I was, I, it didn't even occur to me, yeah. right, that she yeah. had a physical issue. I had made it a spiritual one. So it could be it could be something as, as funny, or it wasn't. Yeah. Uh, it's not wasn't funny to her, but you know something as uh, visible, uh, simple, binary as, as menopause or not, hot flashes or not. Uh, but sometimes you know lots of things can be going on oh, yeah. chemically, yeah, physically with people. Mm-hmm. And you just want to make sure that that you, as as someone who is in some type of spiritual authority or a, a spiritual helping role, doesn't neglect that. That's and good. so, asking people to get physicals, yeah. asking people to, yeah, you know, are they taking their meds? And I, I oh, it's such a good diagnostic question. Hey, has anything changed with your med? Are you taking any medication? Has any of that changed recently? And I just can't tell you how many times people weren't hard hearted. They had. Either they had changed their medication doses or they'd stopped taking them thinking they were good and, and they weren't. And that, that's all that was. They didn't yep. need a sermon. They didn't need a verse. They didn't need admonition. They just needed to go back on to or take less of or more of this this thing. And that was it, you know. And so didn't have that class. Wish I would have known. And so that's that's uh, one you of know, the— I think, I think a category real similar to that, John, is when the, the person who's been such a stalwart— in the faith, whether that's a young person, old person, middle-aged person comes and they, they begin to express disillusionment, darkness in their life. Um, I'm doubting in ways I never have. Almost the, the very first question I will ask is, have you seen your doctor lately? Have you had a physical? And yeah. if you haven't, it might be worth going and doing a blood screen. Like, let's kind of figure out what's happening here first. I always want to assure them that God loves them, no matter how they feel. You know, hey, just want to tell you what the you know, I want to inform them a little bit, but I really want to say, let's not jump to any conclusions here until we make sure you're okay physically, yeah. because that's been real common in my ministry experience. I did not know that going into yeah. it. And I made, I made some of those, I, I almost was overly dramatic in that meeting and, oh, you can't give up your faith and no, you need to hold on. And, right. you know, and almost, uh, it, well, not almost, I certainly made matters worse because I didn't understand that there were physiological things going on that, yeah. that, that clouded the mind. And once those things were resolved, it was almost like the disillusionment and doubt faded, and we were back to, okay, yeah. you're, we're back to we're back to good again. Yep, that's good. Okay, so I got a couple more, and then I'll, I'll give you the last words uh, here. Uh, you know, just things that again, this is part of the art, part of the uh, the learning process of pastoring, walking with people, just to know uh, when trauma is involved, yeah. how uh, things are different uh, suddenly. And I, I, part of me is uh, hates that word trauma because it, my kids they, they don't say this, but it. They didn't clean their room and they're grounded for a couple of days. You know, it's kind of now like now you've traumatized a kid. I'm not talking about that. Uh, I'm talking about something that really is a truly traumatic event that's happened to people. Well, that really does scramble the way people interpret, you know, interactions or uh, situations, sounds, I- I- any of that. And you just need to be, you know, this this idea of trauma informed. You need to understand that's a category. You don't have to know all of, all there is to know about it. Uh, but when you get a sense, hey, I think there's something else going on here, then you need to get some help. And, uh, and that's not going to be fixed with the Bible verse. Um, the other thing I would say, and you kind of hinted this a little bit, the, the whole doubting thing, I think I was taught about one half of the spiritual development uh, of, of a person in seminary and really even just kind of growing up in, in an evangelical church. And so if you know, know this book, it's, it's called The Critical Journey, and it lays out these six steps of spiritual formation. We actually talked about it in episode 44, and if you want to go listen to it, we had a good interview with Nathan Wagnon. But uh, basically, it's this: uh, these, the first three steps are recognition of God, so that's when we become a believer, uh, life of discipleship, we're starting to you know uh, uh, memorize scripture, read scripture, know how to answer things, uh, understand theology. Number three is a productive life, so that's now where we're leading and things like that. And then what happens is... We, we hit a wall. So there's some traumatic uh, event in our life. We, we lose a loved one, a, a spouse. Uh, we lose our job. There's some health or just some, somehow God feels distant. And so at that point we can push through or we can just go back to find a life that kind of helps us make order and sense of all that. Or we push through and to these next three, which is uh, the journey inward. Uh, that's where we're, we're looking in. We're not doing for God. We're just, what we want is God's love. And we're aware of that. That's the, that's the goal. Then the journey outward is where we minister out of that love of, of God. And then finally, if we make it, there is the life of love where the, the thing that defines us more than anything else is being loved by God and just kind of operating um, out of that. So as evangelicals, I feel like we crush the first three. Mm, Let's get them yeah. converted. Let's get them in a Bible study. Uh, let's get them serving. Like that's just, you know, that's what we do. And it's this 
last part that is, it's a little more squishy. Uh, it's not as scientific. It's a little more art form. Uh, that's where you'll hear words like spiritual director and things like that start to show up. Someone that can just kind of guide you through there. You're not, it's not just to memorize more, more verses. I was not taught that in yeah. seminary and it's yeah, something maybe. that I'm still trying, I, I'm still trying to get my arms around a little bit in my own, basically my own sanctification, you know, my becoming more like Christ and, and helping other people. Uh, I still have, I still have things to learn there and I am learning. I hope to continue to learn and be able to give that to those who come behind me, my, my, my family and my kids and, and those that I lead. But I was taught only the first three. And so, so it's a great book, The Critical Journey, if you want to look it up and become familiar with that. Again, episode 44. That's just one of the things as a pastor I didn't, uh, I don't think I learned in seminary. And that's that's part of the art form uh, that I'm still trying to figure out. So uh, Dave, any anything else? We're not taking shots at our oh, alma yeah. mater, uh, sure. but things you wish as, uh, that, you know, that you'd gotten then or things you've learned, uh, since, yeah. uh, since seminary. You know, I think, I think especially, uh, yeah, the, the, the last category, John, I think, I think having, um, whoever you're speaking with, be sure to give them some sense of agency, you know, Hey, if at any point in time, you don't feel good about what we're saying or it's not oh, making sense or you need a, you need a break, let me know. And then I always believe I'm just not a big, the more I've been in ministry, the less I am committed to a one-on-one model. You know, I really think if there's if it's going to be a harder conversation, especially with someone that you think has probably been traumatized or had a difficult past, I'm always about bring an advocate with you. Bring somebody with you. It, this, if it's okay, you know, and we need to dismiss that person because you want to speak more privately, that's fine. But if you want to, bring a friend, bring somebody from community group, bring someone you love and trust so that we can have this conversation together just to avoid any sense of traumatizing a person. You don't want to have any appearance of spiritual abuse or yep. bullying in those conversations, yep. so that's good. You know, I think, uh, to, to, to answer your question about what, I think two things would have been really helpful for me to know more about. One would be how important it is to be on a team in ministry, even if you are a solo staff person in a in a in a certain church. And there's you can build teams around you, even if those roles are informal. You can bring people from the outside and have a sense of help me. I don't want to go it alone. I think my biggest mistakes were because I felt alone or I was embarrassed to ask. So I think I think having a team and then I think it's a good thing to ask for help. It's a good thing to when you go into situations you don't know what you're doing. Whether you have that person again on your team or you don't, you have that person. Um, I think now that I'm an older guy, I think there's a sense of younger men and younger women. They're afraid to ask for help because the sense is everybody in this world is so busy. Nobody's got any margin. I love when anybody asks me, "Hey, can you help me think this through?" And I, I don't think I'm alone in that, John. I think people who have ministry experience have a God-given sense of joy and passing on what they've learned. So all that to say, I wish they would have told me in seminary that very last day, maybe right as I got my <laughs> degree, hey, let somebody else play your, pay your dumb tax, if at all possible. Like, Go find, find them, somebody yeah. and ask questions and learn that way. Because you will learn, you're learning in ways that aren't even, you're not even aware of right now until this situation arises again. And you will quickly remember, oh, I've done this before. I'm not going to make the same mistakes again. Pattern so be encouraged. That's good. Don't give up. You that, will learn, and someday you'll be in the position to help others out yeah, as well. That's right. That's right. And as you do things that matter, you know, we've got the promise of Matthew 28, yeah. uh, 18 to 20, like that's Jesus right. is with you. As we go and make disciples, we try to invest in the church, just serve others generally, whatever it is that we do. We do things that matter to God. He's 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 with us. And so we Holy don't, Spirit we, is we never so go sufficient, yeah. John, in helping yeah. us where we, we're just... We're, we're ignorant or we're insufficient. He steps in and he helps us. He gives us wisdom and guidance. He absolutely does. He's there. And he loves, he loves his people and he will help you, sir. Well, I wish I had, I wish I had this podcast, you know, a long time <laughs> ago. Too. I would have saved myself and, you and, and others. Both, pal. And so, uh, so brother, thanks so much for sharing. Yeah, and thank you. Uh, friends, I hope this was helpful. Maybe one or two ideas you can just kind of, uh, you know, and some of it wasn't even uh, the answers as much as it was just the categories. And there might be something just to kind of pay attention to, go learn some more about, go ask someone else, how would you handle this? How do you handle this? What have you learned? Uh, that might be the real value uh, in this. So we've got some more topics that we will be uh, dripping out here in the next few weeks. Really excited about. But Dave, again, thank you so much. And then friends, as always, we appreciate you listening in. If you have any questions or comments, you can reach us at clp at watermark.org. That's clp at watermark.org. We'll talk to you again next time.